Hello, church. God bless you. It's my privilege to be with you today through this media of communication. First time I've done this in a long time, but I'm so thankful for the privilege. For those of you who do not know me, and that may be most of you, I am Pastor David Knapp, the founder and senior pastor at the Full Gospel Christian Center here in Port Jefferson Station, Long Island, New York. I'm so glad you joined us today. And I pray that something I say will be of a blessing to you, will be of a help. I'm standing in my pulpit right now, or sitting in my pulpit right now, in our sanctuary, which is empty for the most part, except for a few folks who have come, technical types, who have come to help me produce this program for you. Today, I am not going to bring just a single sermon for you, but a series of thoughts and words of encouragement and instruction for all of God's people. And perhaps, if time permits, a brief study on the subject of pleading the blood of Jesus. That's an old Pentecostal term that I grew up with as a boy in a Pentecostal church. I heard my pastor preach on pleading the blood of Jesus, and I heard the old-time prayer warriors gathered around the church altars every Sunday as they would plead the blood of Jesus. I want to explain that to you. What does it mean? How do we plead the blood of Jesus? And what are the benefits for his blood in our lives? But today I am going to bring some thoughts that I'm trying to get us to understand in obeying our national leadership. This is controversial among Christians. Should we close our churches or not? Our president has asked us to close our churches where there are gatherings of more than 10 people. And we and our leadership here at Full Gospel decided that we should obey the laws of the land. We needed to support our president and we needed to support all of those in our nation who are struggling with this virus that is so demonic and, and so hurtful to so many people. So we opted to close our doors. Now, that may not be encouraging to some of you, but in a series of thoughts and encouraging instructions, I want you to try to wrap your mind around the need for us to be a part of our culture and our society and our nation. We are Americans. We are not Democrats. We are not Republicans. We are Americans. And so we need to be pulling together as a nation, following our national leadership. You see, it does not help when people criticize leaders and find fault with our actions or anyone else's. It doesn't help. Condemning the leadership and trying to pull people out of our churches to attend some other church, that's not God at work. That's the devil himself. Pastors who steal congregants from other churches to build up their numbers are not godly men. I'm sorry. They are thieves and they are liars who bring division to the body of Christ. So we are seeking here at Full Gospel to be members of our community, members of the body of Christ who work together, who acknowledge our responsibility to obey the laws of the land. A shame on those and those believers who try to influence the poor-minded among us to leave the church and go somewhere else. May God forgive you, and may our pastors and churches be strengthened. Now, I watched a Fox News special interview this past week. It grabbed my attention, held my attention. It was an interview with the Cardinal Dolan of the Archdiocese of New York City. He was standing in St. Patrick's Cathedral, and that sanctuary was also empty, as is our sanctuary here. Only two priests accompanied him on the altar, and he spoke from his heart. And several things that he said resonated in my spirit, things to which I said out loud, amen. We are living in the middle of a rapidly changing national scene. This is a very dangerous and even a very prophetic time. Jesus is coming for his church very soon. 
I think it's closer than it has ever been before. And so I ask you, think with me for a moment. Are we under God's judgment as a nation because this virus has come? Are we under judgment? I believe in some ways we are. But that is not cause for panic because repentance of our sins will stop God's judgment. When we have sinned, we must admit. We hear God and we hear say, God, say to God, I'm sorry. Father, I have sinned against you. I have broken your commandments, your laws. And he will forgive us. We have a sign outside the front door of our church on the front lawn that says, God will forgive. Just ask him. I want to tell you that that's true today. No matter what your sin may be or mine, if we will run to Father, admit our sin, and ask his forgiveness, if we will repent and turn away from our sin to live righteously, God will forgive. We just have to ask him. We have sinned greatly as a nation. You have to admit with me, God is holding us accountable right now for at least two major sins that he is, I believe, judging. First, we have condemned and blessed gay marriages. Churches and pastors have married men to other men and women to other women. And that has greatly offended our Heavenly Father and blasphemed him. He will not overlook that sin. God's grace and his love are not without limits, but we must turn to him with seriousness and sorrow for our sins. My wife Diane and I had dinner this past week with Pastor Chuck Ferrara and his wife Myung Cha. We were hosted in the home of Jim and Camille Flynn, and the evening's fellowship was precious. We spoke candidly about what's going on in our churches, and Pastor Ferrara was sorrowed that in his church he is finding a battle royal waging. Now, he was saved here at Full Gospel Christian Center many, many years ago, and to this day, Pastor Ferrara still calls me his pastor. He is currently the pastor of the United Methodist Church of Patchogue, located in Patchogue, Long Island. And he and Pastor Randy Page from Christ United Methodist Church, just south of us here on Old Town Road, have been only two Methodist pastors who have stood side by side in the Methodist Church for years now fighting the gay movement. He told me that there is a decision been made now by the national leadership of the Methodist Church to vote on this issue of gay marriage in mid-May. Pastor Ferrara was heartsick. He said that the bishops want this to pass. But he said, if it does, I will have to get out of my church. And they've already told me if it passes, they will take away our church building. So I don't know how to protect my congregation. And he asked for prayer. He asked that God would give him wisdom to know how to comfort his people. He said, I love my congregation. And not all of them are pro-gay. Many of them are Bible-believing, serious Christians. And their future is in jeopardy. So I would ask you to pray for Pastor Chuck Ferrara and for Pastor Randy Page. These are two men who are strong in their betrayal uh, or their, their uh, expression for the truth of the gospel. They are not going to betray their faith. They are not going to move against what God says in his word, and it's going to cost them. So you and I need to be praying. Pray for them. But the second sin that God is angry about is the slaughter of the unborn. 67 million babies have been aborted in our nation, and the blood of these innocent ones stains our land and calls for God's judgment, and I don't believe that he will tolerate it very much longer. Now, Cardinal Dolan went on to encourage his Catholic congregations. He said, do not fear and do not be afraid. 
That's a good word. I had to say amen when I heard him say that on television. God is with us, he said, and we will never, he will never leave us, and you are not alone. One of God's names is Emmanuel, God with us. So talk to him. Run to him. Hide in his presence. And then he added, we are entering the season of Lent, which we as Protestants don't always uh, recognize or celebrate, but the Catholics are very serious about it. He said, in the Lenten season, we draw near to the cross and to the death of Jesus for our sins. He said, it is a somber time, a time for deep, deep repentance. But this time of sorrow does not last forever. He went on to say, we move on to Easter and the celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Death gives way to life as life springs forth from the empty tomb where they had laid Christ. Now for you and I today, Easter is only 22 days away. A day of great celebration is about to come. But in the meantime, uh, there is a need for repentance in America. There is a need for repentance in our churches. And this time of sickness and death in America will end. I, I have the promise of God's word that he'll deliver us from all fear and all the attacks of the enemy. I believe we will come through this battle together. And we will gather together in our churches again. And this empty sanctuary will once again echo with the praises of God. So do not neglect your Christian faith. And do not fear. Fear, do not fear, is found some 366 times in the scripture. One for every day of the year. And even one for leap year when February 28th rolls around four times every, every four years. Uh, our, our church buildings with a small C may be empty for a season. But oh, I do believe that we will return and worship together in this place again. I believe these walls will once again echo with the praises of God's people. So while we await those days and walk out the trials that we're in at the moment, uh, we are still the church with a big C. And we must carry on our work and our ministries. Well, it may not be in the sanctuary, but outside the doors of our churches, we still have ministries that we need to carry on. We all steed, need to comfort one another. Our ministries must continue. Your work for the King of Kings must continue. So let the love of Jesus flow through you in these days of uncertainty. Call your neighbors. This is a practical suggestion. Call those who are not even familiar to you. They may be strangers across the fence. Call out to them. You may find that they are in need of someone to encourage them as you need that same encouragement. Call the older folks in the church and in your neighborhood. Find out what they need. Do some shopping for them. You know, Walmart now is offering early shopping for we seniors who are over 60. I understand it's in the morning between 6 and 8, something like that. The, the elders, seniors, can slip into the store and, and for a little while they will allow you to do some shopping. Do some shopping for your neighbors. Find out what they need. Bake them a cake. I like chocolate with vanilla icing in case you're wondering. But bake them a cake and share a meal. Open your doors. Show some compassion to the homeless who don't have a place to go. And to the shut-ins who are locked away in beds of infirmity, sometimes for weeks and months in nursing homes. Call those in the nursing homes. Send them a card. Send some flowers to their hospital room. Folks just need to feel your concern for their well-being. And I believe Jesus would have you to love his people as he loves them. So, where is God? He's here. He's in you, and he's in me. So, we are in this coronavirus pandemic together. And we are Americans. 
And we as Americans have a history of pulling together in tough times. So pick up your chin and work together for the good of all of us. We're Americans and we need to pray for our president. Please stop your ceaseless, endless criticism of the man who's doing the best he could do. He's done more for us than we could even imagine. And so many are critical of him. But I would ask you not to be one of them. Don't put your tongue to criticize the man that God put in the Oval Office. I don't, agree. I don't care if you voted for him or you didn't. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't matter. He is our president. And we need to respect him. We need to pray for him and stop our endless criticism. I want to suggest that we all read Psalm 91. If you have your Bible close at hand, you may want to turn there with me because I'm going to take the moment to read it. It won't take long. But Psalm 91 is a psalm where we need to hide. It's a psalm we need to memorize. Listen to it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to bear thee in thy, all thy ways. Thy, he shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, God says, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91. Commit it to memory. Pray it every day over your family, your husband, your wife, your children. And then add Psalm 23. And if possible, time permitting, read Psalm 35. Psalm 35 is a psalm where David prays against the demons of hell who were attacking him. And God gave him victory. Great fear is all around us in the 147 nations who are uh, being attacked by the principalities of fear. And the death toll is rising even right here in Suffolk County. But we have a secret weapon that I want to talk to you about. <laughs> For the life of the flesh, Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, for the life of our flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For the blood that makes an atonement is for your soul. The life is in the blood. Now, that secret weapon which God has given to us, <coughs> it is the blood of Jesus, and we can plead the blood of Jesus against the forces of hell and against death itself. In Revelation chapter 12, at verse 11, the Bible says, And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the, uh, by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives until the death. Because there is life in Jesus' blood, God does not give us the spirit of fear. That is Satan at work. If you find yourself being fearful, it is Satan at work. It is not your heavenly Father. He does not give us the spirit of fear, but
but of love and of mind, by a peace of mind and, and uh, the knowledge of his presence. Now, pleading the blood of Jesus is an old-time Pentecostal truth. In the few minutes that I have left with you today, I remember as a boy hearing my pastor preach on pleading the blood of Jesus. And I remember the prayer warriors around the altar pleading the blood of Jesus. Now, pleading the blood of Jesus is an old-time Pentecostal truth. As a boy, I heard it preached in my church at home, and I heard it prayed around the altars time after time. I would hear the old saints cry out to God in intercession, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. This is a legal term understood by judges and lawyers. It is not begging God, but it is presenting a legal argument using the word of God in the ears of God the Father and in the ears of Satan himself. It is presenting verses that demand a guilty verdict against Satan, and legally it is an argument for the defense of the innocent. I plead the blood of Jesus over my sons and daughters. I plead the blood of Jesus over my wife and my husband. I plead the blood of Jesus over our church and over our nation. I plead for God's mercy and not a guilty verdict. So lawyers and intercessors plead with God for a man who is innocent to receive a not guilty verdict. And it represents a legal case of scripture for a lawbreaker to receive a guilty verdict for their theft and murder. So when we pray the blood of Jesus, we're praying for God's mercy to be poured out upon his people. And we're asking for a verdict of guilt against the enemy that he would be shut down, silenced, and removed. So when we come before God to plead the blood of Jesus, we ask for the blood that is full of God's life and the blood that is full of mercy to defeat the enemy. We plead the blood of Jesus against fear, to see fear defeated and its power broken. We plead the blood of Jesus against the coronavirus that comes to kill and we pray for it to be defeated. The life of God is in the blood of Jesus, and Satan hates it because it brought his complete defeat at the cross of Calvary. Fear is gripping the nations all around us. All 147 are battling this spirit of fear, a strong principality, a crowned prince that has an unbelievable amount of energy and power, but the spirit power of fear is broken at the cross. The, he, Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly at the cross. And he gave his power and love and sound mind to us so that we can plead the blood of Jesus against the enemy and see his, his movements stopped and see the innocent ones rescued. So apply the blood of Jesus. It is a spiritual transaction that God applies on our behalf. It's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual transaction. Satan fears the blood of Jesus, so I plead the blood for the ears of God the Father and for the ears of Satan, for the blood to be applied, and when God sees the blood, the death angel passes over us. Remember that in the Old Testament, when God gave to Israel the Passover lamb, he said they were to take the blood of a lamb and place it upon the doorpost and lentils of their homes. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the death angel never touched them. So you and I need to plead the blood of Jesus. I tell you, I plead the blood of Jesus over my congregation constantly, over my wife and children constantly, over my grandchildren, over myself. I plead the blood of Jesus for safety as I travel. I plead the blood of Jesus as I pray in my prayer closet that he would enable my prayers to penetrate into the ears and heart of God and tear down the works of the enemy. So we're going to do that as I close my message. Right now we're going to pray and finish this program for today by asking God the Father to present his blood for us. We're going to plead the blood. Would you bow your head in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you for the blood of Jesus 
for therein is your very life. We thank you that mercy is in his blood. Righteousness is in his blood. Deliverance is in his blood. Healing is in his blood. Miracles are in his blood. So I plead the blood of Jesus over your people today who are under the sound of my voice. I pray that the blood of Jesus would be applied to forgive our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I pray that the blood of Jesus in the ears of the Father will cause him to speak in our behalf and set us free. I pray that the ears of Satan will hear my prayer and that he will know that the blood of Jesus is against him. Satan, you are defeated, and I decree and declare unto you by the blood of Jesus Christ, you will not continue to bring fear upon the nations. We bind your spirit of fear. We bind the authority that you think you have to operate. You're a squatter and a trespasser. And I bind your power to operate, for it is written, whatsoever you bind upon earth shall be bound in heaven. So we bind you, Satan, in Jesus' name. I plead the blood against your every move and movement. In Jesus' name, loose the nations. Loose the people. And Father, as we cast down that spirit, we ask you to bring the life of God to bear in everyone that's sick. Those in our hospitals, Lord, so many of them very sick, some of them dying from this virus. I pray for miracles. I pray for a breakthrough that you would bring deliverance, and that suddenly things will begin to change in the numbers that are being posted in America, that we'll begin to see you push back the enemy, push him back, Father. In Jesus' name, use the blood of the Lamb and defeat him at every turn. I pray now for everyone who's been fearful, everyone who's listened to this message today, we bind the spirit of fear that's attacking them out of concern for their families and their children. I bind you, devil, in Jesus' name, and I command you to loose your attack, cease and desist, and get out in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we loose the Spirit of God, the power in the blood of Jesus. We loose your life over your people, for you have given us life more abundant. Let your blessing come now upon your people. Help us to be those who plead the blood, who plead the blood, who plead the blood, that we might see victories in the days that are ahead. Thank you for this opportunity, Father, to speak to your people. Bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. Now, just before I sign off, I want to speak to those who are a regular part of our congregation. We have a website where you can go to still pay your tithes. And can I tell you that while you're not here, the bills of the church continue, salaries and utilities and we still have obligations that we have to fill. So we need you to continue tithing. Now you can go online and tithe because we have provision made now. If you go on www.fgccpj.com, you'll find provision there for you to pay your tithes. And you have to hit that little box that says giving and you can write in the amount of your tithe and it will come to us through PayPal, a guaranteed and secure way of getting funds to the church. Nobody can get it but the one person here who is authorized to handle those accounts. But otherwise, it's totally private, and it is personal, and it's between you and God. And that little box you check giving, you indicate how much you want to give and send it in. It will reach us through our bank and the PayPal account. But we need your help. Would you please remember to pay your tithes. If you can't go online, then put it, your check in the mail and send it to the church. It will get to us and we'll be able to use it to keep these doors open. I hope to see you soon in God's house. And I hope that this program will help you a little bit today. We love you. We're praying for you. And we're asking God to make you comfortable in his presence and aware of his love. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.